Yes. Sir, what if a writer is attempting to create a story where nothing much happens, where people don't change, they don't have any epiphanies, they struggle and are frustrated and nothing is resolved? More reflection of the real world. The real world? Yes, sir. The real fucking world. First of all, you write a screenplay without conflict or crisis, you'll bore your audience to tears. Secondly, nothing happens in the world? Welcome to Yag's Reviews. If you like this video and the content, please feel free to subscribe. Really appreciate it. In this episode, I want to recap the story of adaptation. I also want to discuss why this is a great scene. I want to describe the character's performance and include just a little bit of trivia. And then finally, I want to wrap it up with my own personal thoughts, specifically on what adaptations from past and present are actually really good, in my opinion, and which adaptations from past and present are not so good, in my opinion. So first off, I want to recap the story of adaptation leading up to the scene in question with Robert McGee and Charlie Kaufman. Adaptation is a story about Charlie Kaufman, a Hollywood screenplay writer. He is tasked by his agent to look at and create another similar work. Charlie Kaufman has decided that he wants to focus on the book titled The Orchid Thief by acclaimed writer and author Susan Orlean. Um, in this book, she has spent time with Florida horticulturist John LaRoche as he has gone through and tried to research as well as clone and save endangered, an endangered species of flower called the ghost orchid. Charlie Kaufman also has a brother called Donald who's more of a wild child. He's more of a free spirit. Um, he has had some fame, but in terms of writing a claim, he's not anywhere near where his brother, twin brother, Charlie Kaufman is. Um, over the course of the story, Charlie is having issues with the story. He's actually fallen in love with Susan Orlean. He's having a hard time writing the screenplay of The Orchid Thief. Because he wants to stay away from using traditional Hollywood tropes and cliches, you know, having a nice, happy ending and big car chases. That's something that he is sticking to and he does not want to deviate from. But along the way, he is in the course of writing a story that's almost not going anywhere. He's writing a story, a screenplay that's writing in circles, and he's also writing himself into the story. So he makes several valiant attempts to, one attempt he wants to actually meet Susan Orlean and kind of get a, an idea of who she is. And so he sends his brother, who is more socially aware, um, he's able to kind of wine and dine and woo anyone he talks to. He's very, he's very good at that. Uh, whereas Charlie's more subdued and more nebbish. And so his brother, Donald, meets Susan. And I may be jumping along within the story, but Donald does meet Susan. He interviews Susan and he wants to know more about what were her reasons, her motivations on wanting to write the book. And she gives like nice answers on why. And he asks her some kind of pointed questions of our who's her favorite living person, dead or alive. And she believes, she believes she says Jesus Christ or something like that. Um, and this causes Donald to go, Hmm. And he reports back to what he had interviewed to his brother. And 
his brother's like anxious, nervous, is like, like, what, what, what did what she say? What would you find out? And she's like, she's, she's hiding something. She's not really being honest. And Donald is keenly aware of people. He's keenly aware of how people react, their motivations. He's actually writing a story um, that's similar to like Seven and a lot of different like thrillers, but it's really good. Like he's, 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 he's reading up on Robert Key's, uh, the art of storytelling. And he's picking up a lot of jewels from that and it's actually helping him. He's actually surpassing his brother. He actually started writing his screenplay after his brother write, wrote his and he's caught more ground. He's completed it and he sent it off to the, the agency and they actually want to work on turn to a movie and it's also pissing off Charlie. So I'm, I'm jumping all over, but essentially Donald reports back to Charlie that she's hiding something. She's lying. You need to read this book. There's something going on within this book. She's talking about passion. She's talking about flowers, the, how, how rare these orchids are, are how John Roach is, is a, how she's inspired by his passion for, you know, dedicating a portion of his life to finding and helping, you know, endangered species like the white, well, um, ghost orchid. And that there's, there's subtext that's not being explored. There's something that she's writing that she's hiding and he wants to find out more. He wants to help his brother find out more. And Donald is like, uh, I mean, yeah, Charlie's like, oh gosh, I, I, I just don't, I just, okay, I, I got to find out. And I, I don't know if I want you to help me, you know, no, we're going to, we're going to help each other. So along the lines, Charlie, he's lost. He's lost in the sea of my brother. He's, you know, finding he's getting more fame and he's, he's, he's impro- approaching on my, my arena and I need to do something about that. I don't know how to feel about that, but um, I'm also not getting anywhere in the story and I also need his help in this. And I'm, I'm not feeling really confident about that. And I noticed that, you know, my brother, he's reading a book by world famous Robert McGee, that Robert McGee on how to tell a convincing story. And he's approaching his story from a place of, I want to be honored. The author, I want to talk about flowers. I want to talk about nothing but flowers. I want to talk about the how in life there is there is there are instances where you don't find what you're looking for and that's kind of written in the story of susan orlean's book that you know there's passion and then there's failure that sometimes you don't find what you're looking for um and the, the journey along the way and he wants to write about that but in terms of how that translates into a compelling movie is something that's wrestling that's something that Charlie is wrestling with and he needs to have validation. He needs to meet with somebody who's more successful than he is. Um, someone who's more world renowned, someone who knows about life and he wants to subtly, not so subtly <laughs> get that validation and get that sounding board. So what better way to do that than go to a seminar with Robert McGee and ask him directly. And what's great about adaptation is it's a movie within a movie. It's a story within a story. It's a meta black comedy. It's a mixed genre movie. It is so many things, but it talks about the idea of creativity, how hard it is to pull from that source, that, that, that muse, that well, what are some things that are lost in translation? What are some things that when you're adapting something, do you want to honor and be one for one with that in terms of like realistically capturing exactly the voice of the source material? Or do you want to add like little dashes of your own flourishes, your own experiences to that work? And are you compromising? Are you taking away from the source material? Are you, are you being untruthful, unrealistic, a lazy in that approach? Or, I mean, is there something wrong with, you know, using tropes, using Hollywood cliches, using things that are tried and true? They may be tired, but they work. They're, they're things that work. And this is the reason, this is the impetus on why Charlie Kaufman goes to Robert McKee. Not only is, not only to release that, that blockage that he's experiencing 
and he doesn't want to do this. Like literally, this is something that he does not want to do. He does not want to get advice from people that know better. He's been forced and pushed to this point. He's been dragging his agent along in the process of like, I'm almost finished this book, but he's done, he's done so many rewrites. He's done so many false starts. Um, his agent's kind of like, where are you on the script? Your brother's like lightning speed. He's, he's already submitted something really successful. The studios love it. They're waiting on you. We're waiting on you. And Charlie is like, I'm, I'm grinding my gears. I'm spinning my wheels, not getting anywhere. So this is my last attempt to make a breakthrough. And I want to show that scene. And then I want to talk about the scene um, in some detail um, and why I feel it's one of the greatest scenes, not only in the movie, because there's so many great scenes in adaptation, but why this is a great scene in the movie. And why I feel is the, one of my favorite scenes in fin- film and media. And then just my, you know, other thoughts on the matter. So we'll go ahead and show that clip. So hit it. Yes. Sir, what if a writer is attempting to create a story where nothing much happens, where people don't change, they don't have any epiphanies, they struggle and are frustrated and nothing is resolved? More a reflection of the real world. The real world? Yes, sir the real fucking world. First of all, you write a screenplay without conflict or crisis, you'll bore your audience to tears. Secondly, nothing happens in the world? Are you out of your fucking mind? People are murdered every day. There's genocide, war, corruption. Every fucking day, somewhere in the world, somebody sacrifices his life to save somebody else. Every fucking day, someone somewhere takes a conscious decision to destroy someone else. People find love, people lose it. For Christ's sake, a child watches a mother beaten to death on the steps of a church. Someone goes hungry. Somebody else betrays his best friend for a woman. If you can't find that stuff in life, then you, my friend, don't know crap about life. And why the fuck? Are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? I don't have any use for it. I don't have any bloody use for it. Okay, thanks. The legendary Brian Cox. Um, you've seen him in Succession. He's also been in, in X Men movies. He's done a range of Shakespeare and theater. Um, just his presence. What I love about this scene from the beginning like from the very beginning of this scene uh charlie is in a sea of aspiring screenwriters and, and, and storytellers and the spotlight is just dead on him and he stands up really sheepishly you know he has an agenda i'm here for an agenda i have a point on why i'm here and how even though he's like very shy and kind of cowardly it's it's it, in a way it's kind of ruthless i'm going to use whatever you tell me, I'm going to use that intel that you give me to help make my movie and how this over the course of this scene, Robert McKee breaks down his question. Like I, I, not only does he break it down, but he dissects it in a way that like you're, you're here for something other than advice. You're here to kind of sharpen your own career, sharpen your own movie and Brian Cox and, and Nicholas Cage. I don't want to take anything from Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage is such a chameleon, chameleon like actor. He, I love him in almost everything that he's done. He brings more than 110% into every single role that he does. And, and it may not land. It may not land, but in this movie, he's playing two different people. Um, one's fictional, like Donald doesn't exist, but he plays it with such earnestness such dynamicism that I believe that Donald is a separate person. I believe that Charlie is separate from Donald and I believe each one of their motivations. I believe, believe each one of their, their roles within this movie, that they, they're two separate people. And he does it so well um, that very few actors can do very few actors and actresses can do what Nicholas Cage can do, what he does in this movie. And he's acting along such great, actors in this movie you know he's acting with chris cooper who's also magnetic meryl streep what 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 needs to be said about meryl streep that hasn't already been said what i love about brian cox and how he dismantles 
Nicolas Cage's argument is that it starts out very quiet. You know, he's sitting down. Um, I got my little mug of coffee or whatever in my hand. And I'm listening to the words that are coming out of Charlie's mouth. And you can tell that, like, this ain't right. Like, he's like, he, I'm dissecting, like, how, how, what do you, what do you mean nothing happens in life? Like, why would someone like you, who's not young, like, you know, you should know better. Have you not experienced life? Have you not fully invested and in gone out in life? Like, let, let's break this down. And over the course of him breaking down Nicolas Cage's question, the tempo and his energy and his anger arises. Like there's so many examples out there. If you just read a newspaper, if you just look out the window, if you just travel, if you listen to people stories, you wouldn't say what you said. And for you to say what you said, you, it's very ignorant. It's very, it's very shallow. It's very irresponsible for someone as old as you, because you're not, like I say, you're not young, but someone as old as you should know better. You should know better than to say something like that. And the only reason why you said what you said was because you had an agenda. And even though he doesn't say all that, like he doesn't say all that, he's been in the business long enough to recognize the subtext of people's questions. What's the underlying theme of someone asking me what they're asking? What is what is the motivation? What is the core on what the, why they're asking me this? And they're asking me either here, you know, and the energy goes up and it starts off like, like a story, like a beginning, very soft, very calm, very quiet, a middle. Okay, here are the examples. Here's the here's here are, here's the conflict, and then the resolution. You've wasted my time. You've wasted my fucking time coming here for your movie for your screenplay. This is my time, you know? And some people may think like, that's not, why, why did you yell at him? Like he's asking you a, a valid question, but no, like I, I game recognized game. I know what you're doing. I know why you're here. And it forces Charlie to come to grips, not only with, and he even says that like this, there's a companion piece scene after this scene. And I don't want to really focus on that so much. I want to focus on this specific scene because this scene awakens Charlie from his ennui, from his writer's block. He has to face the fact that you're not looking hard enough. You're you're looking at the writing of what Susan wrote. You're infatuated by her. You don't really know her. You know, you use your brother kind of kind of look at her and I'm, I'm i'm i may be miscrossing these scenes of when they happen when donald meets susan but you're not you don't know about life you're, you're assuming life from someone else's perspective but you're not actually using you're not actually looking and because you're not looking it's coming off very shallow it's coming off very boring that you're without conflict no one's going to want to watch this. From the core of what Robert McKee is stating, you need conflict. You need some type of resistance, some type of hook on why an audience should care. And even though it's not one for one, you should write in a manner, you should approach the story in a manner that here is a goal, here is the wall, for that goal, and here's the motivation of overcoming that wall. And then, then the, you know, on resolution, you know, that, 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 that resolution that wraps all that up, somebody should change. People should change within your story, even though in life, their argument may be made that, you know, some people, some people may, may agree or disagree that people don't really change. But when we're talking about visual storytelling, where we're talking about storytelling in general, as an audience member, as a reader, I need to see that change within that character. And if your book or if your screenplay is not transformative in any way, it's, if it's just a checklist of things that happen without any type of conflict or resolution or transformation or evolution or de-evolution from those characters, then it's, it's, there's no point in telling it because you haven't 
done the work. And that's the reason why Robert McKee forces that onto Charlie. And it's that's, that's why Charlie resonates with that. When he sits down meekly, it's like, okay, I don't have to add, I, I mean, I don't have to add a rebuttal. I don't have, no, that he saw it. He saw everything that I was trying to do, everything that I was not trying to do, everything that I was trying to say, everything that I was not trying to say. He saw all that from that one question because he's done the work. He's done the work in trying to look within that subtext of like, what is, what is the hidden meaning behind the question that you're asking? What are the, what is the hidden meaning beyond the words that Susan Orlean has indicated in her story? And these are things that you won't know until you actually meet that person and actually, and actually you live that experience or interact with that person going through that experience. So, um, I kind of want to wrap up with why, what are some great like adaptations? And I don't want to stay too long with it because like I said, there's a companion scene after that, um, which I also think is really great. You know, he talks about how it doesn't matter how you start. Um, as long as you wow them in the end, that's what matters, you know. Um, and that's also a great scene. But I want to talk about adaptations. What are the most successful adaptations that you can think of? The most recent adaptation that sticks with me, and I've talked about this time and time again on this channel, um, is Arcane. I have not played anything League of Legends at all. But when I've watched Arcane and the characters in that story, um, it's so compelling. It's so engaging in how they crafted those characters. When I talk about, when I see saw Fallout, I, before I talked about on a similar video, I can point here or here, where I didn't really give a fuck about Fallout. I didn't really play the games. Um, they didn't resonate with me. But watching the show and how they adapted parts of that series identify with me. I've played, now I've played, you know, Fallout 4. I've, I've experienced that. I want to play more. Adaptations that are, and some may argue that this may be a good adaptation, maybe a bad adaptation. You know, Watchmen by Zack Snyder. You know, he's a very divisive, visionary director. Um, I've talked about him. Also on this channel, one of his series, I'll point his video here. But yeah, I feel that Watchmen, as well as 300, these are really good adaptations of the source material where he's taking bits that are one for one from the original. And he's at his own flair. You know, he changed up some portions of Watchmen, specifically the New York incident, and he added his own spin to it. You know, same thing with 300. He added his own spin to it. And I think that the things that not only that you take away, but if you add more than than you take away, I think those represent great adaptations. If that, first of all, you have to get the source material. You have to understand that completely. And when you don't understand it, when you're just doing paint by numbers where you're adding your own agenda, your own flair, to that adaptation, it's very recognizable. It's it's something that you meet, immediately see and it turns you off. Case in point, The Witcher, where I'm talking about Netflix's Witcher, where the showrunners didn't care about the source material. They only wanted to put in their own agenda, their own stories, and just use dashes of what was in the source material. And that was apparent by the show star, Henry Cavill. That was apparent by a lot of the audience members who, who's viewed it. And yes, it's a, su a successful show. They've done spinoffs, but they've never been as great as season one through three. No, I was saying season one through two. Mm, give or take. You could be argument there. Um, another not great adaptation, Netflix's <laughs> Avatar, The Last Airbender, where, yes, we're borrowing, we're taking the source material from a venerated, incredibly popular, incredibly masterful animated cartoon show. But we're removing elements from the core, from the core of that show, and we're injecting 
stitches and pastiches of what Game of Thrones were, you know, thing we're trying to make it darker and it just didn't work. It, it did not work for what it was intended to be. And it showed, you know, the, the original show run is no longer a part of that because it, it, it was not sustainable. You cannot start from a place of I'm going to add my own spin and take so much away from the source material because you're showing you don't understand it. You're showing that not only you don't understand it, you don't care. There are many, many examples of adaptations that just don't work throughout the history of film, throughout the history of video games. I don't want to spend too much time on that. I just want to show those brief examples, those most recent examples of the good ones and the bad ones. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. I, ho I hope um, you enjoyed this. Like I said, if you enjoyed what I had to say, feel free to like, share, subscribe. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun making this video. Um, and I actually want to stop with a quote from John LaRoche that adaptation is a profound process. It means you figure out how to thrive in the world. And I'll stop there. Um, there are so many things that are happening in the world. There are so many things that are transpiring and causing people to kind of look at where my place is, where do I fit in, can I survive in this current climate? And yes, you can. That's my cat. I, I, I don't know your entire circumstances, but I feel that as all human beings, we wouldn't be here without adaptation. We wouldn't be here without having struggles and being pushed to our limits to change, to evolve. And I feel that this movie, and I feel that the message of adaptation in terms of creativity, in terms of understanding your role in the bigger story of life and how to persevere and thrive, I think that's an incredible and powerful message. And that's all I got. So like I said, it was great talking about this and I hope you guys take care. All right. Cabs out. Thank you.